One reason that we call it contextual electronics is because we're trying to give you a sense of how electronics work in the real world. And I can't think of a more real world thing than a design review with a applications engineer. If you don't know, an applications engineer is someone who works for the company you're usually buying stuff from, and they help you design that part into your product. And so I've worked with a lot of these over the years, but I never really had a good sense for what that interaction looked like because as a college student or as a high school student, or really before you get into industry and before you have the, the dollars of your company behind you, you don't have a reason to interact with field applications engineers. Once you do, if you are so lucky, uh, it's a wonderful resource. Really, the field applications engineers, they are experts in the parts that they cover, and they give you feedback and ideas that you just wouldn't think about otherwise. And so they are a wonderful resource if you can get access to them. Unfortunately, as a hobbyist or as someone who's maybe outside of the industry, you don't have them. Or even if you're in a different part of the industry, you might not have them. So I had the opportunity to talk to a field applications engineer from Quicktel. Quicktel is the company that makes uh, cellular modems. They're out of, based out of China. They make cellular modems. They're on the ABC board that we designed as part of Contextual Electronics. And I had a chance to talk with Roy Chen, who's one of the applications engineers here in the States. He's actually, or sorry, not in the States, in North America, because he's up in Toronto. And he's really great. So. This episode is me getting feedback on the ABC design, which is this cellular Bluetooth board that we designed as part of the, the course. And we, re I recorded it because when else do you get to see that? I, I never could have recorded the interactions I had with uh, field applications engineers when I was uh, working for a company. But you know, this is this is my show. This is my <laughs> this is my life. I get to record it. And Roy said it was okay. And so I'm really glad that we got to. So what this episode is is basically. Uh, Roy giving me feedback on this design. I had followed the design guide that's from Quicktel. And so a lot of this is basically him kind of pointing out like, hey, you missed this part or hey, you didn't do this part. But that interaction is super important because having feedback and having a reaction to the thing that you designed, that can save you time, money, embarrassment. Well, it doesn't save me embarrassment because it's actually me, it's Roy telling me, hey, Chris, you didn't do this right. But that's great. That's what I am happy to show here. So. I hope you enjoy this episode with Roy Chen, field applications engineer from Quicktel, and uh, we'd love to hear what you think about it. So here we go with Roy. All right, so welcome to Contextual Electronics. Uh, today we're talking to Roy from Quicktel, and uh, welcome, Roy. Thanks for joining me here. This is the first time we've done this kind of design review on uh, on camera like this. I'm really excited. Yeah, also my pressure is my first time too. Thanks yeah. for, invite, for the invitation. Yeah, well, I, I'm really excited about using the BG95, EG91, all the parts that QuickTel is making, I think are really exciting uh, and uh, are really good fit for this project we're working on. So we're going to be talking about it a little bit, but you're going to tell us a little bit about your first, yourself to start with. Yes, uh, okay. My pressure to join today. Yeah. Um, I'm Roy, I'm Toronto-based. Uh, actually, I've been working with QuickTel since 2010. This is my 11 year in QuickTel. Yeah, before, and at the first two years at Quicktail, I was a hardware engineer, so which means I have a very strong hardware background. Uh, we can share a little bit later about yeah, the yeah, designs. Yeah. And then nowadays, I'm in charge of uh, technical sales for Northeastern region, uh, including Canada and the uh, United States. Nice. Yep. Yeah, it's, I'm in Chicago, so that's why, uh, yeah, it's a good fit. <laughs> yes, yes. Good. Uh, yeah, I did. A, we our team also did a little bit of review about your schematic and the PCB. Mm -hmm. I think we can go dive. We can dive into this part. Okay, great, great. Uh, yeah, first of all, first of all, the design is very impressive. Uh, yeah, just in terms of because you you are considered to have a cap, cap, uh, compatible. Um, sorry, you have a design for. Um, several module in one PCB board, like yeah, PG91, exactly. PG96, PG95. Mm -hmm. So we need to review this. Uh, you can, uh, now I'm sharing the, a PDF file. Mm -hmm. It's called the design review report. Um, oh, okay, is it a uh, different window maybe? You can see or no. uh, maybe I think you have to share that different screen. So while you're doing that, let's just take a quick look at the. Uh, so I'll just for people that are watching that maybe haven't seen it before. This is the the board. This is the ABC board that's been designed. So while Roy is pulling up that other PDF, uh, we can take a look at this. So this is the yeah the multiple modules, and uh, the idea here is that on the back side we have uh, basically the idea is that you it's a sandwich of you know a, some kind of daughter card and then uh, the main module itself and those two things go together to. Um, to uh, 
plug in to access the cellular capabilities and also the Bluetooth capabilities with the NRF52 that's on board. So yeah, so these these are the uh, the things that are, you know, this is what we've been doing as part of Contextual Electronics. This is the uh, the board we've been designing, and uh, yeah, there's I'm excited to see this report. So it looks like Roy pulled it up here. So here we go. Yeah. Great. Okay. Let's go. Yeah, normally we, uh, okay, give me one second. All right, there we go. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, so actually you had a good design for the power. Just mm -hmm. so here, you pay attention. We recommend customer to add in one zero dial. Mm -hmm. So this is like, because the power for the module is between different module. Uh, PG96, PG91, PG95, those three module have a little bit slight different uh, of the power supply range. Okay. So PG96, because it support 2G, so the power range from 3.3 to 4.3. Mm. And if uh, some customer they uh, this, they are going to use in the PG PG95 M2, which is a, uh, excluded 2G, so the power range is between 2.8 to 4.6, 4 mm -hmm. so more wire range. And the okay. typical yeah, typical value for PGN6 is 3.8, mm -hmm. so which is now now you did a very good, is 3.8 here. Yeah, and that's actually a really good point too. We I kind of st stressed over that a little bit because the BQ25895, uh, which is the charger chip, it has this kind of like kind of soft upper range. So if you don't have a battery plugged in, it's meant to obviously charge the battery, but then it's this kind of range that can go anywhere from pretty much what the battery voltage is. So wherever the battery is in its life cycle, uh, if it gets, if there's no battery there, it kind of goes to the top of its range thinking like, hey, I'm trying to charge. It might be at 4.4 instead of 4.3, like you're saying. So it sounds like the Zener there, like you're saying, would help to protect the chip in that, yeah. in that scenario. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Okay, for the USB port, you know, uh, for the um, most of application using the PG96, PG95, they may use the USB port because USB mm -hmm. port is for 8 command for uh, GPS mm -hmm. and also for software debugging and for yes. more updating. Yeah, which is very important for the customer. They if they don't have UART, uh, USB port connecting with the Mac processor, we also recommend the customer to have this port be reserved as a test point. Okay. Yeah. Which you, yeah, which like in the future when they do the certification at the Verizon AT&T, mm -hmm. they require to catch some test log, which mm -hmm. uh, USB port is the only source. Got it. Okay. So that's that's a really good point too. And I'd love to yeah. hear about certification a little bit more uh, mm -hmm. after we go over the review. As the you know to to clue people into what we to that have not looked at the design before. Uh, this is the, so basically there's a second USB port. The first USB port is for talking to, this is for charging the battery. The USB-C is talking to the battery and also the NRF-52. NRF-52 talks through a level translator to the BG-95, BG-96, EG-91. But then I decided to put a second uh, USB-B micro on here uh, to talk directly to that port uh, in order to, yeah, like you said, software, debugging, all that stuff. And then also some people might just want to use the the chip by itself and that's also a possibility so yeah okay great good so in terms of the sim car uh you are the port which is uh, you had a good design and uh, you, because you already put the uh, uh, volt shift mm -hmm. so between the microprocessor and the uh module which is yep. 1.8 uh the chip out that was okay. easy. I just copied the app note. I mean, that's really a lot of my MO was just <laughs> follow follow yeah. the app notes. There's a really good design hardware design guide, which I really appreciated from QuickTel the um, for for each of these parts. So that was helpful. Yep. Yeah. Okay. For the other parts, I I would go diving a little bit uh, after this uh, PDF and uh, for sure, just to need to pay attention for the um, 2G uh, uh, mode. The mm -hmm. current of module will be reached 1.8, 1.6. Okay. This uh, is you know this uh, GSM behavior. Yep. Yeah, those really and big the, spikes and basically it draws on the battery and also you need to make sure yeah. your traces are yeah. Okay. And then you need to have a GPS and the main antenna be matching the impedance for 550 ohm. Mm -hmm. yep. Which this like uh, many customers they avoid or the ignore this and then when they produce the PCB board, 
maybe the thickness of PHP4 is 1.6 or 1.0. So the trace layout, the why, the widen, the sorry, the the layout should be different. Uh, We can go, we go a little bit about the RF design recommendation. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. For this, for next one is ADC, uh, because. For Pigeon 6 uh, has two ADC port, Pigeon 5 has only one, mm-hmm. and this uh, the voltage should never exist uh, exit 1.8. So ah, right here okay. you did so, um, divide yeah. by yeah. Yeah, so that was just a generic you know voltage monitor divider there. So at least the if, if nothing else, if I'm going to keep that, then I need to change the ratio. I think I just did a a one to one ratio, so it would only get it to half half mark, but it would be not as useful in that case. Yeah. Okay, you can just put this as res- uh, reserved and then mm-hmm. just put the DMP. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Next one, USB boot. Uh, USB boot is for emergency downloading purpose. Okay. Which normally this means it's open. Okay. Only when module like uh, they run abnormal uh, mode and it never got recovered, so you have to put this pin too high for the downloading. Okay. That's good. Yeah. Enough. Okay. Uh, this, those two pins, if you're not using, you can reserve the PSM indica- indicator, is output. This is for microprocessor, they can detect if module is at the PSM mode or not. Okay, and what is PSM mode? Uh, yeah, PSM mode is power safe mode. Okay. It's the, um, a weak, we, also you can consider this as a deep sleeping mode. Okay, okay, good yeah. to know. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so right now it's, yeah, it's showing just on my schematic here, the, uh, yeah, so it's just DNP. So you're saying that maybe hooking that over to a microcontroller would be prudent yeah. just in case I ever want to use it. Okay, that's really good. Yes, feedback. yes, okay. yes. Yeah, the next one is the W disable. This uh-huh. is a airplane mode to enable, which is input for the module. So, you know, when the module, like, uh, it's just a very similar as our cell phone, you have airplane mode. Mm-hmm. When you yeah. turn, o- turn on turn to the airplane mode, you're not a- able to receive and send the message. Uh-huh. So this is like, you can have, a, this is one type of power safe mode. Okay. But uh, yeah, just to disable the RF parts. Okay. Yeah, so that's a good good thing to have there. Um, yeah. Okay. And uh, the re- right side is AP ready. This is input actually. This is a uh, input input pin from the microprocessor. Uh-huh. Uh, so when the more when the uh, microprocessor is in the sleeping mode, they can to uh, like let the module know. Like you, this is like the pin to trigger the UART port. You know when the module uh, when the microprocessor at the sleeping mode, it, the module that the the CPU is not able to process any data to receive in the, any data. And uh, in the one scenario is when the module receives message or the data incoming. So the module can detect or wake up the microprocessor. Hey, this is the message you should to receive and you should to process. Then okay. the, they go to wake up the UART port. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I, how and what would you say? I mean, like, how critical is that? I mean, in terms of functionality, is that more like a nice to have, or is that like a yeah, you should definitely like in, in all these cases? Are these all yeah, you should always have these hooked to the microcontroller, or is it more a uh, if you want this function and it's specific to your needs, then you should do it. Yeah, so very uh, few customers, they may have very sensitive on the power consumption for both uh, microprocessor and the whole system. So they may have this pin to connect to the microprocessor because they want to put the, mo- the microprocessor is always lower sleeping mode. Uh-huh. But yeah. also they have, you have another uh, um, alternative way to achieve the lower power consumption. Like say you can cut off the power of, my, of the uh, module. You can put the, the, the power safe mode. And you know, also like uh, ST micro, mm-hmm. N- NXP micro, they also very low energy um, uh, profile, right. which, is, yeah. uh, which, is, which is good enough. Yeah, and that's and that is that is kind of the thinking there that to have a, a kind of supervisory micro in this case the NRF fifty two is pretty low as well. Uh, yeah. Being able to just kind of go into deep sleep and then shut the cellular all the way down. Uh, yeah. So it is using it more like a modem as well. Uh, I should state for people that haven't seen these parts before there there's a full ARM court there's a full ARM uh, processor inside there that you can use as an applications processor for a lot of these right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, this is about a schematic, and then we can. I have a, I have another uh, point I want to show. Sure. Can I? Okay, you can see my screen. Yep. 
Oh, this is the uh, slideshow, right? That's what you're trying this to This slide, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, you can, uh, do I need to full screen? Let me see. Uh, that might be helpful, yeah. I think I'm. See I think this is the presentation view, so that's why it's it's not full screen. Okay, I think it's okay. Yes, yeah. that's okay there. So. Oh, this okay. Okay. Yeah, that's great. But now it's better, huh? Oh yeah, that's great. Yep. Yeah. So uh, in also part of schematic uh, for the antenna design. So for the main antenna, which you already reserved the pie matching, which mm -hmm. is good. Yep. And because this uh, normally for the testing and the to match antenna, sometimes when they have a second harmonic um, interference, so they have adding some uh, capacitor or inductor to mm -hmm. reduce yeah. it. Uh, for the GNS antenna, so I, I realized that you have uh, this antenna is only for passive antenna. I don't know for your application, do you need a pass, uh, active antenna in the future or no? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, um, you know, it was more of a placeholder. Honestly, at the beginning, I'm not planning on using it. Um, mm -hmm. But that's, I mean, in terms of a placeholder, that is a, a great time to think about it. So yeah. you're saying to maybe put in a spot for an amplifier or something like that there? Uh, actually, Morge has a uh, RNA, uh, lower noise amplifier already okay. built in. So would you, or, or you need only have the power for the... Mm. For the power though, for the antenna, which is okay. my lab, my right side is VDD, uh -huh. it's three point three volt, and then you have a, a little bit of a large ten ohm ten ohm resistor, mm -hmm. and then large uh, inductor, so which is enough. Okay, and yeah. and that so then how how does that actually look on the physical side? So like if the antenna does the antenna have, is it not like a UFL or something like that? It's some or is or is it just coupled in to the actual coaxial connection there? Uh, which is that of other is not uh, any uh, impact just to hear this for the power only okay and um, just to you have a little bit increased the size of your pcb board because the resistor we recommend is 0805 okay yep. and the inductor can be 0603 mm -hmm. and there's another one capacitor which for the power feeder yeah and yeah then, so it is it is pretty tight up a, up in that area so yeah, that, yeah, yeah that is maybe the reason not to but i think that yeah Either way, that's uh, something to consider and something to look at. So that's that's great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Next one uh, for the some for the customer, they they do not have USB port, mm -hmm. but they are using the GPS application. And we over the, uh, one option by software. We have the you know we using GPS. You need to have a NEMA sentence N E M A. Mm -hmm. Which is uh, it's better to have the full sentence output. Like every second, you refresh in the sentence location. Uh -huh. And uh, if you don't have the USB port, which you're not able to get from the, from the a from the main port, the main port only reports one sentence by re by inquiry. Okay. And so it's then, like a polling versus a reporting kind of idea. Yes. Yes. Okay. And then uh, we have the another option is uh, UR three, the third UR port. It's mm -hmm. able to have the output. Like same feature as a USB port, if you don't have a USB port. Uh -huh. So this is like option for for your for, for your next design, for, or maybe when you need the GPS functionality. Okay, that's great to know. Yeah. So right now the USB the SIM, uh, sorry the uh, the modems UART three I believe goes up to the daughter card. Um, so I would think that if we need to use that, maybe we could use that as a reporting, and just tie it up through the daughter card back down to yeah. You know. Yes. Something. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But uh, to don't need to worry because uh, also without your UR port, you can also able to get the GPS lo location or mm -hmm. acquisition fr from the main port. Right. Main so you UR just, port. It's just uh, you have to pull it and you say, hey, what is your update? What is your update? Correct. That, yes. That's an idea. Yep. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's great. Our next one, we are, we can jump to the PCB. Sure, sure, and I'm yeah. gonna pull. I'm gonna pull mine up on my screen as well in case there. Yeah. So I, I had only sent. So, so as so people know, um, uh, I had sent Roy, uh, the PDF of the Gerber's basically or PDF output. Um, uh, so we'll actually have access to the the 3D view here if you wanna take a look at that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, okay, go ahead though. Yeah, yeah. In terms of the footprint of the three module, mm -hmm. I really um yeah, I noticed that you have um this module is like. Uh, maybe you're referring to PGN6, mm -hmm. yep. for, which PGN6 is like a middle size, can, can, can um, compatible with uh, PGN5, 
That's the only one thing we need to pay, pay attention because when you do the each 91, each 91 is cat one module, then the size, the outline is a little large than B96. Oh, interesting. Okay, so yeah. so same footprint, but the actual physical outline you're saying? Yes, correct. Oh, okay, interesting. So which you can refer in to the the one here in the in the top. Yeah. So you have the outline for a different module. Mm-hmm. So you can, and also on the module, physical on the module, uh, on each each and every one module, the the four corner has uh, four ground pins. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Which uh, yeah, yeah yeah. Okay. Yeah, and so like looking at the three D model here too, so that that might be one of the biggest. Uh, so right now, I so so I had talked to QuickTel about the basically I have VG ninety five in house right now. That's what's going to mm-hmm. go on my prototype. Um, but yeah, you can see that it is pretty tight there. So uh, especially. I would say the biggest concern are I'm not sure what the the gap difference is, but like, but this right here, I really squeeze that in. So I yeah, think yeah, that, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, that one's going to be the biggest one. So that's good. That's good to know. Um, mm-hmm. So I think initial testing, I'll probably leave it. But then, yeah, any kind of revisions, I'm going to have to probably move stuff around if I want to get access to the to the Cat One capabilities. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, in okay for the next page, I'm showing the. Uh, the difference between the P96 and P95. Mm-hmm. Oop, yeah. There we go. Yeah. So there is a two main pin, uh, two pin difference between two modules. It's one's ADC pin, which you already designed like for the as a test point, yep. and another is a reset pin, which is uh, critical for the for the module for the mm-hmm. for for both. And then ADC pin on P96, there's two individual ADC one, ADC two, mm-hmm. but for P95, there's only one. And then, and also, because actually, uh, P95 inside of those two pins connecting the same one pin to, uh, for the, to the chipset. Okay. So, that's so, a, so it's labeled differently externally, but then with the thing that's actually, or the resource is actually going to internally on the silicon. Is yes. Better, or yes. this is the same, rather? Yes. Okay. And also, the same thing for the reset pin and the power key pin for mm-hmm. P95, mm-hmm. Uh, so which we don't recommend. Uh, the power key should never put down to the GND permanently. This okay. is very important. Should never uh, be put, uh, like you should never be pulled. So like the pull, like if you were gonna just tie it low, always you mean? Correct. Okay. Yeah. You cannot do this because you know several customer they they are they just try because some sometimes you have lack of GPIO pin from microprocessor. You yep. don't have those pin to control the module and say yeah. uh, uh, let's just put down because. Yeah. Once right. I, just leave the it on all the time, right? And we'll yeah, turn on yeah. the software or something. Yeah. Like, yes, Ugh. yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because for the most, in the in the past, but almost for the, all of the CAT1, CAT4, 3G, 2G module, it's the same uh, architecture, uh, architecture. So which put down, the module will be mm-hmm. automatically turned on. Mm-hmm. But for me, in this case, P95, it's not um, applied to. So you have to to control power key and then to pull it down and then pull up it back. Yeah. Yeah, it is that it's that pulse that that is yeah. in the, the hardware design guide, and and it's inverted as well. It's um, there's like a just an NPN inverter that drives. Yes, it. yes, yeah. and also inside the chipset, inside the ba- I mean the chipset, I mean uh, baseband of of the uh, the Qualcomm chipset, mm-hmm. and there we um, we uh, distinguish those two p- the pin the functionality by software. Like if you press longer of this pin. The module is going to reboot. Oh, really? Okay, so it's yeah. like a ad hoc like the, uh, reset button. <laughs> yeah, yeah, correct, correct. Huh. Yes. Oh, so, so yeah, like that would here, really, it would really not work well then if you tied it to ground, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's going to reboot always. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it would be that would be a bad that'd be a bad startup time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so only this is you need to pay attention. Uh, okay. uh, the big difference between two modules. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the next one uh, here's the one another pin uh, called the P O N trigger. Mm-hmm. Uh, this means only for P95. We added this means to wake up from the module, from, wake up the module from PSM mode. Okay. Yeah. Normally, you have the way to because like I, I also need uh, uh, I need, would like to introduce a little bit about what what module doing during the PSM mode. Okay. Sure. So during the PSM mode, the module's power supply is uh, below 10 micro amp. Mm-hmm. It's very low. It's like yeah. almost turned off. And then during this mode, the module is or every part is, is sleeping. Only yeah. the fresh memories is keeping this information on their network registration. 
And it's not able to like uh, receive data or calls or anything like that. It's not in a receive mode. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, yeah. Totally correct. Yes. And then you when you when you need to wake up module, you have to operate as a, the first time to to power on the module to power key, mm -hmm. and then you have the power key to turn on turn on the module. Yep. And then for the BGN five, besides the power key, you have another option. This is a power on trigger to wake okay. up the module. Like okay. this is a. The additional pin for the PGN6, PGN5, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so this is another one where I should be. So is this the the kind of case where I should be doing, uh, like like the power key? I should have like an inverter and driving that. I think one of the problems is that I, I was starting from a BG96 footprint on board. Yeah. Um, and then, but then there are some pin differences, so that's that's on me for not uh, having the pin differences labeled here uh, on the BG95. Yeah. Oh, your current design, which is good. Mm -hmm. And you can also use the power key to pop to trigger the module from the from wake up from the PSM mode. Uh -huh. So you, can yeah. you put it into PSM mode from software and then wake it up with hardware using power key? Yes, you can. Okay. Sure. Okay. Uh, right. so, wake so up. The idea is that the feature difference is that you could also have a little bit more hardware control using this pin that you're talking about. Yes, the uh, wake up from PSM mode they have two options. One either the timer, you know, actually mm -hmm. PSM mode is controlled. The timer is controlled by network. Okay. And then there'll be wake up when the time more ran, runs out. And also okay. the hardware, like for example, you need to have a wake up module to do something uh, manually. So you need to wake up from the by the mm -hmm. hardware, which is yeah. two options. Oh, it's always available. Okay, that's great. Okay. Yeah, it's good. It's good. There's a lot of options. It's yeah. It's just kind yeah. of making sure. I, I think the one thing that uh, so I had uh, my firmware engineer uh, Eric, uh, who, who's a, a friend uh, on on a, a different video I'd done. And uh, and one thing he always talks about is like, make sure there's at least one way that you can always have an escape mode and like get things working. And and I would think that you know like having at least one way to reset the the chip and get uh -huh. it into the right mode is is really important. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Next one. This is like a little bit design tips for the SIM card. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, personally, I had a very good experience once I was supporting one of customer. Mm, they made a design for the SIM card. They also 100% following our uh, design guide. Mm -hmm. So added the capacitor and also added the ESD. Mm -hmm. But they didn't pay attention about the ESD the components, which mm -hmm. here we are mentioning. The parasitic uh, capacitance should not more than 15 PFA. Oh. So this is, is very important because, you know, the SIM card have two kind of uh, voltage either 1.8 or 3.0. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, both is 1.8. Okay. And then, you know, here you have a capacitor, you have a ESD. When yep. you do, do, in, uh, design an imperial, the capacitance is going to increase, right? Got it. And then so, they're going so, to delay. So is, there, the is there a number, like a total number of, the total capacitance value that should be on there between the, the diode and the and the So uh, here, cap? yeah, we, we put here as a 30, uh, 33 plus mm -hmm. 15, plus 15, which is a, uh, no more than 45, yes. Got it, okay, great. Yeah. So, uh, otherwise, you the data, like a clock data, is going to delay. Yeah, then, right, it's gonna then, have rounded edges and you know delays yeah, yeah. times. Yeah, because it expects, basically, it's like a, it's almost like a serial protocol where it's sending out, basically, the modem is talking to it and then it's expecting some response within a certain amount of window, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah this is very critical, yeah. Uh, this well, this part is about um, RF design. Uh, we can this also we have we provide RF layered application nodes. Oh great! Uh, yeah, I'm going to open this one. Okay, great. Yeah, and let me I'll pull up while we're doing while you're pulling that up. I'll uh, I'll show the layout where we are here. Um, yeah. So based on the stack up, so we're using JLC the 2313 process, um, and so looking at the back side here. Basically, what I calculated using my tools were um, uh, was using uh, what is this? Yeah, let's see your design rules here. So the design rules for RF: 0.2 millimeter, point, 0.2 millimeter uh, space, 0.2 millimeter trace, and that was going to get us. I think it was like 50.3 ohms based on based on a coplanar uh, waveguide design. So that's that's where my numbers had come from. As as a starting as a starting point, I'm sure I, I could have been wrong. So mm -hmm. okay. So we can we can uh, review from the page. 
Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Can you zoom in a little bit on that, please? Can you see now? Yep. Better? That's great. Yep. Yep. So here, it's, uh, we noticed that here the power you are designed for the, to the module. Mm -hmm. And uh, we recommend that the power, the voltage, the why then sh should not no less than two millimeter. Okay. Yeah. And okay. if uh, for some customer they need a longer, uh, and also, but also very, very important because you have, a, you, you're doing the four layer, four mm -hmm. layer design, which is, yep. this is a, you can just, uh, yeah, which is, it's good enough. And so just to be clear, that is, I think that's on the, I'm just looking at the design here as well. Mm -hmm. um, just trying to, so there's two power areas. Is that, do you know if that's the RF? RF uh, and the baseband, yes. Yeah, so, but is the, is that the RF or the baseband input that you're talking about there? Oh, uh, yes, that, this that, is, uh, that this image. is baseband, yes, this is baseband. Huh. So I thought that's here, the lower left corner, is that right? Of the, of the model. Oh, this is, uh. This is a top, I believe. Mm -hmm. This part, your your screen, this that part is is okay. Okay, all right. So then you're talking about, um, sorry, the RF. Uh, okay, the RF. Yeah, so the sorry. RF section up here, you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I make this a little bit easier for people to see too. So I'll turn on high contrast mode. And so just for clarity, the this is the outside of the module here. If we look at the, uh, I guess I don't have the backside silk turned on. There's the edge of the module. So this is the top right corner. Oh, this is flipped view. Sorry, I'll flip. This, I put the uh, module on the back side, so it's a little confusing. Uh, okay, so then, yeah, so then that's why that looked a little different here. So you're talking about this section here. And you're Correct, saying yeah. The, the trace, you're saying the trace going to the 3.8 volt rail should be two millimeters minimum? Two millimeters, yeah, at least. Okay, great, that's good to know. So then basically mm -hmm. I could change that in, the, uh, in my design rules to say, so this right now is, oh wow, how would you even, get two millimeters would it just be a, a ground pour or what i guess you get ground pour pretty easily so those two pieces should connect uh directly like uh right mm -hmm. yeah because so you're saying like just have uh, you mean the two pins connecting directly into the ground yeah pour? Yes, yes okay to the power of your power of power right okay yep okay great yeah i'll definitely make that change okay So next one is about the uh, use SIM card. Mm -hmm. uh, we noticed that this, the, uh, let me see. Uh, here, the power for SIM card VDD and the ground, uh -huh. more than 20 mil. I don't know, maybe here, it's just maybe this is a 12 or some 16. Okay. This is, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think I know what you mean. So that's uh, to show mine here, so that's, uh, so the SIM card reader is on the front side, mm -hmm. and this is the back, the backwards from all that. So you're saying that the the power going to that pin uh, specifically, so the and it is kind of interesting that the the um, the ground and power are both sent from the module itself. So there's ground and USIM ground and USIM power that are both sent directly to the SIM card instead of just giving it like a like the three v three or three v eight from the rest of the board. Yes, yeah, because of the reason we recommend this way, this, uh, the, the design on this way, because we had uh, experience on our module in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, several customers, the PCB board is more complicated than yours, and mm -hmm. they have a digital ground, they have an analog ground, maybe I have another ground. Yeah. So some, once one customer, they connect the ground to the analog ground, which is... Uh, it's not matching, like a, so, so it's always like the SIM card is right. initializing to fail. So which yeah. means now, uh, if even the pin inside a module is connecting directly to the uh, the main ground, but we recommend customers to say using the, the SIM ground. Got it. Yeah, yeah that, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah and, and just to have a known flow, and then for troubleshooting as an applications yeah. engineer, I'm sure you can be like, well, you didn't do this thing, and so that's a good place to start as a troubleshooting yeah. method. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's good to know. Yeah, you're right. This is like a, it's a very, that's 3.5 mil trace. That's way too small. So okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how much power does a SIM card usually take? Uh, it's very small. Maybe yeah. just a few amp, min amps. Okay. All right. Yeah. So just a, as a general design rule, you're saying move it up to yeah. a larger trace just to make it easier. 
Mm -hmm. Make sure. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Next one, what to say here? So here is a little bit uh, layer the suggestion for the UR, for the SIM card circuit. Mm -hmm. And then you have the, from the module pins, and then to have, you have a series zero ohm, mm -hmm. and then two parallel 33 capacitor, and then EST, and then connector. Yeah, okay. So this is like this, we recommend the, this sequence. Oh, uh, you're saying the order of? The order, yeah, from the, 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 the trace. Uh-huh, okay. Yeah. So some of this might have gotten shuffled as I was moving between different, and I didn't put mm -hmm. the board view back here just so people are clear, but uh, you're saying, so we're kind of looking at the same areas here now of, uh, so you're saying that because, so what was the, what was the order again? Uh, from the module, you are looking from module, from module code first to the zero ohm. Okay. And then capacitor. I see. Okay. So the, yeah. yeah so it's ohm. the, yeah. It's the same as the your um, is like following the sequence of the schematic. Uh huh. Yeah. So yeah. for the reset line here, so sim, usim reset goes to resistor. Yeah, resistor to, to the capacitor. Capacitor. Got it. And that would be C forty two. And highlight that here. So C forty two, and then finally go to the connector. And so yeah, it looks like. Oh. This one. And then you also you need to pass the EST. Mm -hmm. and then to the connector. Yeah, so it looks like this, yeah, so this is the ESD, and then, then which is the one to the, go to the connector? So then this one, I see, because of, yeah, so how how that's all hooking together. So this is finally getting to the connector down here, so it's mm -hmm. it's kind of hopping around a bit, so, okay. And, and what is the reasoning before that uh, that ordering, just, just as a, uh, in case you need to put, like, resistance in line later instead of the zero ohm? Uh, in the, because in some case, um, in, or, in order to design like according to the mechanical, some, sometimes you have a large or longer trace which need to go from module to the SIM card. Uh -huh. So we have to say this way, you have to keep the, each pin as a very similar distance, similar uh, length, and then you have a, like a similar design uh, architecture, architecture. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's great. And then we also mentioned here the v, the main main power trace should be away from the SIM card signal. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And and why that's just in case there's any like noise that couples between. The Correct. Two, yes, just about noise or the power drip, power drop, something. Uh huh. Yeah. How, how sensitive? How sensitive are SIM cards? Uh, it's like I've actually for Ketam one. I think it's very less. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes for 2G, for Kettle 1 or Kettle 4, uh, you are sending the large data, the module is power consuming hard, large power consumption, okay. which, which uh, causes a massive interference, which the other part maybe is more impact. Mm -hmm. But for this Kettle 1, I think uh, this is uh, to say, yeah, just to say, as long as you have the space, you are able to make this happen. Mm -hmm. So keep this as far as possible. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and I yeah. think that the, um, yeah, like in a 2G, if you have these huge, huge swings of current, yeah. you're also going to have mm -hmm. the, the equivalent uh, inductance that happens and coupling to, to different things, so EMI yeah. that happens. So, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. So here is the part for the USB. Mm -hmm. So we recommend you have this, the, like a, this is in dif differential pairs, Mm -hmm. And then the, between those two USB ports should be uh, surrounded by the ground, I don't, if you, if possible. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point. So let me pull that up on here. So that's mm -hmm. that's coming in on the back side um, of this design. And so these did change a little bit. I got some feedback from the uh, the PCB house that my space uh -huh. to um, drill holes was a little bit low. So you're saying though, like, so then it comes in here. So this has ground all around it, but then yeah. the but on the front side, uh, now this is isolated here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so that would be, that's actually not too bad because then I could just literally drop a, if I can find space for a a, a ground uh, plug here, then I can I can fill all that in. So that's yeah. that's mm -hmm. really good to know. Yeah, okay. yeah. so I'll, I'll definitely work on that. Good. Yeah. 
Actually, I can probably even do that here. There we go. I think I got it. Yeah, almost. Mm. Yeah. Okay, great. Good. Yeah, for the next one, it's about the RF part. Mm -hmm. um, yep. uh, oh, here. I think you consider about the mechanical or the like interference between this uh, screw hole. Mm -hmm. You have the, this layout. Yeah. It's a little like uh, curvy. And uh, I don't know if possible, you like put this a, a little bit away because, and then you keep the, uh, the trace, arc trace away from the power. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so you're thinking maybe have it, um, so yes, to show people. Let's say maybe about. you can mm -hmm. reorganize the, the, the capacitor or the resistor of the RF, mm -hmm. and then go straight from a left side, not to the top. Mm -hmm. So pin 49, you're saying to go from pin 49 up to, to the, uh, this is the UFL connector. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. And so I think the main problem is just that the module edge is right here. And so oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. to get an actual pie filter in there was, mm -hmm. was very difficult. Now, I guess one thing we could do is I could do more of a straight shot and then, you know, remove the pie filter, but then that has its own risks of, you know, there's, it's likely that you wouldn't be able to. Yeah. Yeah. yeah actually on your design, because this trace is very short and I'm in total, maybe less than one, mm, one centimeter, mm -hmm. 10 millimeter, yeah. which is, uh, should be, should be enough. So we have a much, uh, kind of very less, slightly, uh, cable loss. Mm -hmm. And also you did a very good design on the ground pins, ground vias. Mm. And uh, I'm going to share you another PDF. Okay, Please. great. Yeah, that's one thing that um, it was hard to kind of get in, in, in here. It was tough to get the, the vias. And definitely, like, I, I, I was thinking about it being right over top of the power. And that's, that's just a function of, like, the fact that there's, yeah, there's not much room to get uh, other stuff in here. So I did have, I guess this is a capacitor here. And this is... Um, this is just kind of the run, the range of different parts. So I guess I could remove some of these. I I basically I had um, I had a bunch of like really large. I guess on the the top side I have really large bulk capacitors here. I, mm -hmm. took, I turned the uh, uh, modules off here, but uh, I I had I had all these these caps, but nothing could fit up here where the RF power uh -huh. is, and that was really the problem for a lot of this. Is just that there was not room for the power even on the back side. I see. I see. So like right, that would have been up in here. So mm -hmm. and and also the height restriction. So I have a, a height restriction of 1.5 millimeters. So I, what I tried to do is have um, I, I switched from that 1210 or whatever that larger package was. I think maybe 2512 down to 0603, but I have a bunch of them in parallel because I've experienced in the past of having um, brownouts due to you know during transmit and thinking mm -hmm. about Cat One being a little bit more stringent than a Cat M1. Uh, that's why I wanted to have a, you know, a bunch of parallel capacitors there. Okay, good. All right. So you said you're going to show another PDF here. Yeah. Um. Yes. Here. So this is a generic ARM design recommendation, uh, which this part for the schematic we have pi matching recommend recommended, mm -hmm. uh, which is same as your design. And then uh, here, uh, this is called um, clam clamber a uh, clam clamber. In our design. So here we did a, a, a simulation about uh, the high uh, thickness of PCB board is 1.8, sorry, mm -hmm. 1.6. And then what's the tra trace, what's the wide and oh, yeah. what's the clean ratio we should do right. designed. That's an and interesting they, uh, difference too, because um, so the, the the stack up that I'm using is actually, it's, po it's only 0 0.1 millimeters versus 1.6 millimeters. And so like, uh -huh. You talk about the difference in trace sizes is like significant, and so that's why yeah. I think I think if you do a two-layer design and you have that thicker trace, uh, sorry, the thicker board thickness, um, you can make a much thicker trace, which also fits that coplanar waveguide better. Um, but in this case, I actually ended up, uh, if you look at the the design here, um, the uh, I ended up necking all these down because I had to use this thinner trace in order to hit 50 ohms. Yeah, and these yeah. are uh, these are like some some things to neck the back, you know, to, to go back from a thin trace to a thicker pad. Normally yeah. I would try and get uh, a, uh, you know, a thicker trace that matches the size of the 0402 components. Mm. But in this case, uh, since I'm using a low cost board house, I, I can't define the stack up myself. So I think oh, the, 
the answer normally would be, you know, define your own stack up, do your own thing, but I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. a cheapskate, so. <laughs> that makes sense, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah here just to say, uh, pay attention on the design, like uh, we recommend here, like as you did, you have uh, several VRs, ground VRs between yeah. those RF, ca RF cable. Mm -hmm. This is to create a, a rule for the ground signal to mm -hmm. the feedback, right? Yeah, yeah. This is important. Yeah. Yeah. I've had a lot of trouble with those uh, SMA connectors that you show in that drawing there, actually. Uh -huh. yeah. Not because of the the SMA connectors were fine, the trace was you know the correct width and everything like that. It was actually because right when the tra the thinner trace hits that really big uh, mount point, so like yeah. the landing there, mm -hmm. that's actually been my problem in the past, where you have this huge discontinuity because it's like the trace is happy, it's happy, it's happy, and then it sees this huge bulk of copper, and it's like, I don't know what the impedance is anymore, and then, you know... <laughs> You know, especially yeah. like when you're doing gigahertz level designs, it really starts to matter. Like in the megahertz, it's usually, okay. you know, the hundreds of megahertz, it's okay. But the higher frequency stuff can really start. I'm, I'm not sure what bands are up in there, but it can really start to mess with your <laughs> mess with your signal integrity. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. So this is just a general for the ARV design. I mm -hmm. think right here, back here. Yeah, that's all about the, your schematic and the PCB layout review. Mm hmm and then uh, for the um, uh, customer who need to more information, we have here uh, the download the link. Mm -hmm. So for three modules. Great. Yeah. yeah. That's really great. So what about, so you'd mentioned the, um, you know, some of the certification stuff. So talking, mm -hmm. sending off to Verizon, AT&T, things like that. What, is, what does that process usually look like for people that are interested in that, in that sort of thing? Yeah, first of all, the board is a Verizon, AT&T, PDCR, BFCC approved. And then we uh, we do the certification for Verizon. Now Verizon, you know, during the pandemic, so they changed the way how they sort of certified device and module. Okay. Uh, used to, they put um, a very um, difficulty for the module and the bo both module and the device. Mm -hmm. And in the past, you have to be sit on the lab in the lab and then doing oh, the, like week two weeks for yeah. the for the device certification. Nowadays, they simplify the process for the device, but okay. the, they more complicated, make it complicated for the module. Right. It sucks for quick tell, it's great for them, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Exactly. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So, so, now we so have how's, it, how's it gotten more stringent? It's just more in depth look at the, the transmission characteristics of the, of the RF front end, or how does, that, how does that end up impacting things? So, for the Verizon, take, take example for, uh, for the Verizon certification. So, now they have like a few cases, it's more network related. related. And the one, just one of them is very um, like a mandatory case is called a data file or, or, or of the air upgrade. Mm -hmm. So with a default, a folder firmware and this part. Uh -huh. And then for the all customer, you once you have the account on the called the open development protocol, um, and then you have account, you have you're able to submit your device information to tell them which module you are using, and then you you will download the test case. Okay. And then you can do the test in your office and then oh, submit. Really? Oh, that's yeah. Great. yeah. And you can submit over test log. And then because also every test will be linked to the browser server. They also they, they can monitor the test the process and it was the well, what did what did you do? What firmware you're using? Like uh -huh. kind of this. Okay. That's great. And now, so that's actually really critical too. That's why you said earlier in, in this recording that you need to have that USB connection so that you can yeah. log the data, get the firmware if you need a different firmware set yes. in there. Um, yes. To make sure you're passing all these tests. Yes, and then we have uh, in Quita we have uh, one expert uh, who in charge of the certification, mm -hmm. and then we can introduce to you to by email. His name is Yong. Uh, he's um, he been in this industry for about 15 years. Wow. Uh, he knows all of the uh, key, key people in the Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, mm -hmm. and uh, in Quito we have uh, certified uh, about uh, 50 more than 50 device in North America last year. And That's great. Yeah. And uh, I mean, uh, different skills, different uh, variants like this, mm -hmm. from CAT1 to, from CAT1, Nerve Nail T, CAT1, CAT4, CAT6, and also CAT18. Now, now we're also working on 5G as well. Oh, wow. That's great. Yeah. 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 And um, I, I think I mentioned the, the roadmap. I think I may have looked at it on the video a little bit, but um, I really like the idea of these, like, mostly pin compatible, you know, like there mm -hmm. are some differences as we talked through, but like, I really like yeah. that idea of like being able to just kind of swap out the module that's on there. So I really hope that yeah. QuickTel keeps doing that. I think that's, that's a great like upgrade path for, 
for future future modules and you know instead of redesigning the whole product on my side it's really just buy a different part solder it down and then yeah, it becomes yeah. this different technology that really is helpful and that already could exist for different regions and different you know capabilities and stuff like that but i i really appreciate that in, in the module makers i think that's a lot of the value yeah we have several options uh, should be compatible from cat one to you can do from 2g to cat m1 or mm -hmm. cat one and you also i also use even cat four and also we have cat four to cat one and then different, yeah. different a little large and also in the future we have m2 Mini BCIE, up to two is kind of up to five G, so which oh, is wow. also it's compatible. Yeah, that's great. That's yeah. great. Yeah, and uh, I, I described the you know the Cat One, Cat Four, Cat M One stuff like that. But could you give a quick rundown for people that don't know what that is that might be watching this? Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, like our cell phone, we can consider first our cell phone is kind of about a Cat Four. You're doing the you can do in the video streaming, you can do the video call. So which the Cat4 is the upper link is 50 meg, down in the 100 meg BBS. So, and for the uh, like application for the video streaming, so Cat4 is uh, suitable. And then um, for the customer, they're doing the, like a uh, tiny data and uh, maybe send some picture. That's the maximum meg, uh, when you have two meg or some file. The Cat1 is enough. And also Cat1, Cat4, the coverage is in, in, it's already there for a long time, yeah, forever. Right. Yeah, and that's actually a, a reason that I, I explained um, when I was starting this stuff as well, like that I was interested in the swap is that Cat M1, even though it is out and is broadly available, it's not available everywhere. And being able to switch to Cat 1 in certain yeah. places and certain, you might be able to look at your phone and say, hey, I've got signal. And then Cat M1, your your little device <laughs> doesn't doesn't work yet. And, you know, yeah. it's it's on the way, but it might not be there yet. Actually, yeah, it is. Because Ketamon Y has already been announced and then deployed since about two years ago. Now the coverage in North America and Canada, including US and Canada, is quite a very match uh, already. Mm -hmm. So based on our customer, because we all been shipped about more than five million, maybe eight million already for mm -hmm. Ketamon One in mm -hmm. North America, which uh, the feedback is very good, very positive okay. for the coverage. Good. And then. Uh, the th also, for Cat1, the penetration is network penetration is better than Cat1 because the consistency of T is uh, below uh, minus 100, minus 110, like this. Mm -hmm. And then for the m most application, like we call it IoT M2M, the people doesn't need to uh, lower higher data rate. So the uh, only piece of the information once a day, once a week. Yep. And then Kind of lines would be a very good option for like a metering application, uh, lighting. We have a customer like doing the lighting, stream lighting. Lighting, oh, like yeah. industrial lighting. Okay, industrial so not, lighting. Not like uh, your light bulb is not cellular connected, but it's, it's someone's like light ballast in a gymnasium or like a factory might be might be. Yeah, so they call it, yeah they call this smart city. Uh, oh sure, yeah, and I guess yeah, light uh, like uh, street lights, right? That makes yeah, sense. Street lights, and then because you know like, they, the Wi-Fi in the in the middle of the the road. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. The reason of this market is booming because you know the cost of Kenam wines getting down and lower yeah. and lower, yeah. and then they are able to replace the gateway, yeah, you know, which is uh, used to ro uh, the erosion one to six or maybe one to ten, one to one hundred mm -hmm. of gateway in the between the each unit they communicate with the cell range or ZGB. Mm -hmm. And now with the Ketam One, the cost can be they can able to in, install the all, for all the unit. Mm -hmm. So then I also, and the Ketam One, uh, for my personal personal understanding, like uh, you know, 2G is there for the, some country. They have if they keep in 2G, they may not to implement the Ketam One yeah. because 2G Ketam One is also supporting the mobility. They you can mm. do the movement for the tracker. It can do with yeah. the Ketam One. Right. And yeah, you see yeah. that a lot with like the SIM 800, SIM 900, like the small modules. A lot of the uh, maker boards that are out there use those still. And they are active a lot of places, but uh, some of the, U at least in the U.S., a lot of that is getting shut down and getting, you know, the band, or sorry, the uh, the uh, the white space is getting moved around and, and yeah. uh, allocated to different things. Yeah. For the for some for the country like the U.S., they shut down 2G. Uh, some, I mean, maybe they are the first country shot to shut down 2G. So that reason they more prefer to have Kenam One network coverage. Mm -hmm. yep. And then uh, T-Mobile, the first uh, carrier implement the network neutrality. Mm -hmm. Actually, there was uh, for the light lighting um, project in Las mm -hmm. Vegas. It's oh. first uh, city program. And also Europe for the country they keep 2G. They may they they prefer to have network neutrality because. Like to say, uh, network neutrality is kind of like technology to replace. 
uh, short range, like GB, Bluetooth, uh, uh, like a, a 900 mega, 433 mega. Mm -hmm. So those kind of um, a chip, chip can be replaced by Nerban LT because the cost is uh, similar. Mm -hmm. And also um, for the ZigB Aurora, this kind of you need to have um, a central network to be built. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So one of the, one of the thoughts for this uh, sandwich, you know, module yeah. that, that yeah. I'm thinking about making is, you know, maybe throw a LoRa module on there as well to extend yeah. the capabilities. But like you're saying, it would some you need to have some kind of node that basically acts as the as the capture for all the the smaller nodes, and then maybe bundles it up, puts it into a network packet, and sends it yeah. up to the server. So there it's is the a server, lot of yeah. there. Yeah, you have to have the central like a network to create yeah. a center. Yeah. An individual yeah, like center. Hub, hub and spoke ah, instead of yeah. just like each each node is be able to yeah. talk directly back. So yes, yeah. by using cellularly, which is simple, just to program and play. Mm -hmm. This is a, the most advantage and the beauty for the cellular module. That's great. Yeah, yeah. yeah and I, I mean, yeah, being able to get a signal anywhere, well, or almost anywhere. You know, <laughs> deep yeah. deep wilderness, you got to go to a satellite, I think. But uh, yeah, any city, uh, it's especially like all like you said, asset tracking, like being able to track where you're your food order is throughout the city. It's like, you know, that, that doesn't come for free. That someone's got a cell modem on their, on their device, on their bike or, you know, their caviar bike or whatever. So. Yeah. Uh, here in my screen, I'm sharing the latest, this data is up to June 1st. Uh -huh. oh, great. Uh, this is, is about mapping network development worldwide. You can see there's the purple colors cover both mm -hmm. North American Canada and the South, uh, South uh, Africa, South America. And also Mexico is using at t network. So it's a uh, CANM1 plus Nervan LT. And uh, Europe is kind of mixed. So it's uh, CANM1, Nervan LT. And China, we also uh, going to have uh, CANM1, both, both okay. CANM1. Yeah, yeah. And Australia is uh, Puro uh, CANM1. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, this. Yeah, that's another thing that's interesting as well, because like even though these, these are the technologies, the CADM1 and NBIOT, are like the two different types of technologies. Those are the frequencies that they use, all that stuff. But then there's also frequencies within those bands as well that are, I don't know, do those cross over more than, than some of the, the GSM stuff used to? Because I know that there's different modules types that you need to get in North America versus worldwide and those kind of things. Oh uh, yeah, they have, a, they have a several ma um, ma mainstream bands they're using for like for uh, North America, the band 12, mm -hmm. 13, the five is the main is the main band, which is a, all of them is a low band. It's a, about a 700 meg. Mm -hmm. And then for the, also they are um, doing the, like a, a band 66, band 71. Uh -huh. It's also about a 750. Yeah, it's below the bear frequency of the GSM, and the, which it requires a, a longer a, like a, a longer large size of antenna design, which yeah. is also important for the customer who wants to achieve the tiny size of the product, you have, they have to consider about the antenna size as well. Right. Yeah, it's always that weird trade-off of like, yeah, you need the bigger antenna, but also then you can get through walls a little bit better, you know, like, so it's like that weird, you know, it's, yeah. it's like yeah. it's a tiny little silicon device with a huge antenna hanging off of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. By design, there's a tiny size, you, you already sacrificed the performance of antenna. Yeah. yeah. And also the good, the good thing is uh, at t they renewed to test the standard uh -huh. For the Canon One uh, tiny size, they have a two different uh, category. Big size, you have to achieve the 20 dB or 18 dB uh, output, we call them TRS, TRP. But for the tiny size, like the, they put uh, the dimension less than 20, uh, about 20 uh, millimeter, something like this, a centimeter like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was only needed 12 dBm, dBm outputs, yeah. which is the very good for the, right. it's yeah. easy to achieve. It's easy to achieve. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of really interesting things, and I, I really appreciate the fact that you, you know, came here to record with me and, you know, give me feedback on the design. That's really valuable. Yeah. Um, Roy, where, where could people, so if people are interested in building their own designs, where could people find information about you or using QuickTel parts or, you know, getting design reviews and things like that? Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, I have my email right here. So, and uh, at the very beginning, so this is my email. Okay. And also, we have uh, in our open website we have the inform information inform at quicktail mm -hmm. com. So we have sales uh, North America sales at quicktail com. So we are easy to appro approach, and uh, we have um, more than ten engineer uh, engineers in uh, based on the local based. Mm -hmm. We can support okay. you in, in real time, and um, yeah, 
we have a very strong team here like it is. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Well, Roy, thanks so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. And uh, I, I'm looking forward to implementing the feedback you gave and uh, and uh, getting some more, getting these boards back and trying them out. So thanks. thanks. Yeah, my brush too. Yeah, yeah. it's my first time, but it's impressive. And it's very, very exciting. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thanks. So that was episode six of Contextual Electronics Podcast. Uh, a little bit different than the other ones. You know, it was more Roy helping me, and I realized that's a little different. It was less pointed questions about Roy's background, and usually we try and get more of a feel for for uh, what the guest is doing, but Roy was such a great sport to play along, and I really appreciate him giving me that feedback and giving me the advice. Uh, if you want to reach Roy, we'll try and put the contact info in the show notes. If you are listening to this and you want to see some of the diagrams and the things that... Uh, that came up in this episode. Those will also be linked in the show notes. Uh, of course, if you want to, you can always go and sign up as part of Contextual Electronics. The Contextual Electronics people have seen this entire design process, and they actually have seen me make these some of these mistakes in real time, or oversights, let's call them, maybe not mistakes. And uh, that's kind of the thing that we try and do with Contextual Electronics. We don't just try and show all of the stuff like we are here, uh, we try and show the entire design process. And that's kind of the idea of the course that you're seeing as I'm doing, as I'm making these decisions, as I'm doing part placement, part choice, all of these things. And then eventually, you know, coding and we're into the build and the coding and the troubleshooting, all of these different steps. We're trying to bring forward all of the things about electronics that might not be obvious from the from the outside and and this is from my perspective as well right so as someone who started from no knowledge at all to moving to where i am now 15 years in i'm trying to bring the things that were super confusing to me to the forefront and so hopefully that's useful for you if you like that you can always go and sign up over at contextualelectronics.com we just enabled a free week for anyone who wants to try it out so go and if you just sign up on contextualelectronics.com that first week's for free you can cancel any time before that first week is up and you could check out the content for free and we hope you like it. If you do that, go check out the forum. There's also forum posts associated with every single episode of Contextual Electronics Podcast. So if you have any comments about this, you can always go and comment over there as well. The forum is free for all and open to all. And there's some really great people that help answer your questions about general electronics. And uh, we're trying to build a community up so that more people get into, an electron in into the electronics industry and try this stuff out because that's what we really like here. So that's all for now. We'll be back with more episodes of the Contextual Electronics Podcast. In the meantime, please tell your friends, share the podcast, tell other people, give us reviews, anything you can do to support us. We really appreciate it. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one.